Good day, everyone. Welcome to the Center on Aging Colloquium Series, Spring 2015. Uh, it is my pl uh, pleasure to introduce Jonathan Rush. I, I keep wanting to call him Dr. Jonathan Rush, and that's going to happen very soon. Uh, Jonathan, is <laughs> Jonathan is a graduate uh, student, a PhD candidate in psychology. Uh, he is expert on within-person design and within-person measurement, and will talk to us about many of his activities and some of his insights today. Uh, Jonathan has co-taught a, a number of courses uh, on um, an undergraduate research experience where we've collected intensive within-person data through daily diaries or online. Uh, he has led a number of research projects, uh, both with uh, physicians and with uh, the community on uh, really high, highly dimensional uh, within-person data on well-being. Uh, and I think uh, it's one important aspect, uh, given the, the range and variety of measurements that are often brought to, to bear for within-person measurement. So today, Jonathan will talk about optimizing measurement for detection of within-person change and variation. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining. Uh, thanks so much for having me here. I'm thrilled to be here and share some of my research and um, mostly I'm going to be talking today about optimizing measurement and um, looking at within person designs but also using these designs to better capture between person differences as well. Um, so just a kind of broad overview of what I intend to cover today. Um, I'm going to start off just looking at different issues that sometimes come about with cross-sectional or widely spaced longitudinal measures. Um, and then I'm going to focus on this with more in terms of the measurement side of it. So how do, how do measures kind of, how are they affected with these types of designs? And then I'm going to get into disentangling the, the between-person differences from within-person variation. And then um, I'm going to look at some design-based approaches to try to improve measurement to better capture between person differences and also get at these within person variations. And with this, I'm going to kind of focus more on the intensive measurement designs. And then finally, I'm going to, we're going to look and discuss some different analytical approaches to best assess these types of measures and these designs. And with that, I'm going to discuss some multi-factor analysis, multi-level structural equation modeling. Um, before we get into it, I just want to brief kind of aside to just discuss um, the reliance on self-report data. So throughout this colloquial series, there's been a lot of talk on technology, different um, advancements to kind of improve measures to get at more objective measures of activity and things like this. Um, like, for instance, today I have my Fitbit accelerometer and these, these types of technological advances, I think that they're fantastic because it kind of allows you to reduce the reliance that you have on self-report data, which can be flawed in a number of ways. Uh, but it's also important to keep in mind that self-report is really critical in a lot of ways. And there's some constructs and some phenomenon that you can't really get at with objective measures. So even though there's different problems with self-report data, certain things, when you're assessing things like thoughts, feelings, experiences, you still need to rely on self-report. Some ways, sometimes the best way to get at that is just ask the person and to get at their subject, subjective experiences. Um, and a lot of the issues with self-report stem from the design and how we go about the timing of when we ask them and how we ask these questions. So using different innovative designs can sometimes reduce a lot of the issues that, that come about with self-report. So today, um, I think this slide was presented a few weeks ago in Scott's talk on different longitudinal designs. Today I'm going to be focusing on three of these different types of designs. Um, the first one being these widely spaced longitudinal designs. So these are designs that are typically um, a single measurement every 
few years with a wide gap in between. And you'll see that with, in terms of measurement, these share a lot of the same issues and problems that we have when, um, that you see with cross-sectional designs as well. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about these measurement burst designs. So these are the second one here. These um, differ from the widely spaced designs in that they allow you to assess frequent measurements, um, frequent intervals, to disattenuate some of the measurement um, within person variability from the between person differences. And these are repeated many times over several years. And then the final design I'm going to discuss is the, it's also a measurement burst design where you have closely spaced measurement intervals. But in this case, you have multivariate measures embedded within that so that you can get at these latent scores. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this as we go through it. I always find it nice to start off with uh, this sort of theoretical breakdown of, of uh, an individual's variability and their true score over time. So with this um, figure here, we have the blue dots, which are the observed measurement points. And then we have this kind of squiggly line. This represents an individual's true trajectory. So this is their true score on a certain variable. And you can see that depending on when you measure, you're going to kind of capture different points along, the, along their trajectory. So even though um, you might be measuring, um, yeah, so in addition to the different points along the trajectory, you also measure each thing with the combination of their true score plus error. So the, the point never accurately captures the trajectory precisely. There's always some element of error introduced within that. And the point here is this just to demonstrate that when you measure and how frequently you measure plays a role in the conclusions that you're going to come to, both in terms of the person's level and their trajectory. So for example, if we were to measure at certain points along their trajectory, we might get kind of their true level to be assumed to be, to look something like this. However, if the person has the same trajectory, but we measured at slightly different intervals, their level might look very different. So when you measure and how frequently you measure plays an important role in the conclusions we draw and how we assess between person differences and long-term change. Okay. So I'm going to just discuss a few issues that come about with widely spaced longitudinal designs or cross-sectional measures where you're measuring only one point in time. And a number of biases are often introduced that can impact the true level, that obscure your ability to capture where the person actually is at that point. The first one is kind of the obvious one that we all think of when we think of cross-sectional measures and self-report. And that, that's the fact that we don't really recall our experiences that well. So there's some degree of retrospection bias. And this is more problematic depending on how, how wide or how long the interval of recall is. So if you're asking someone to recall their experiences or their behaviors or their actions from the past year, this can be pretty problematic um, when they're really far removed from that. So you can think of examples in your own research, I'm sure. Um, you can think of things like how many cigarettes have you smoked in the last year? I mean, it's pretty easy for me to remember that because it's a nice round number, but for someone who's a smoker, it might be a little bit more difficult. And then you can think of other constructs. So if you're thinking, okay, how much physical activity have you done in the last year or the last month? Your recall might be affected. You might not remember it as well. And then if you get into other things like joy, how much joy have you experienced in the last month? This is something that's pretty difficult to remember. You don't have, it's difficult to kind of bring about exact instances of that experience. So it's challenging to then aggregate this and to respond in an accurate manner. 
Some of the other biases that come into play are social desirability biases. And um, the one I think we think of most frequently when we think of social desirability is when you are wanting to present yourself to be more favorable than you actually might be. So in the case of reporting on certain behaviors, this would be the impression management. So this is where the individuals purposefully attempt to present themselves in a more favorable manner. Um, this is probably less likely or less common than people might think it is. So it, in certain situations like unfavorable behaviors, it might be the case that people try to present themselves more favorably under, under reporting the amount of events, for example, like drug use or things like this. Um, but the, the social desirability bias that's probably more prevalent is the second one. So this is the deceptive self-enhancement. And what this is, is that when you're asked to recall and report on a certain behavior or attitude or thought over an extended period of time, it's difficult to generate precise instances of that experience. So again, with joy or satisfaction with life is another one. You don't really recall if you say, okay, in general, how satisfied are you with your life? Um, I can't really generate exact instances of my life satisfaction over time. So what, I, what you do instead is you rely on this more top-down approach where you have an impression, a self-perception of yourself as being, okay, I'm generally a pretty happy person. Things are going pretty well. So then you report is fairly high without actually recalling exact experiences that led to that <coughs> level. Um, you can think of, so another example that I tend to like, um, so I have a sister, actually this is recorded, right? Um, so my friend has a sister and um, my friend's sister has this belief that she is a very healthy family and she doesn't allow her children to eat junk food ever. So if you were to ask her, how frequently do your children eat junk food? Her perception of herself as this healthy family would be very little or not at all. So the perception is what's guiding the response rather than the actual behaviors or the actual experiences. Yeah, I'll get to the reality in a minute. <laughs> Um, so some other issues with single occasion measurements, or again these widely spaced longitudinal measures, is that it assumes that people are stable in their levels within this range of time. The problem is, is that people actually fluctuate. So things like well-being or exercise behaviors or any other measure, if you're actually fluctuating, but you're only measuring them at one point and you're assuming that that's their true level, then all this within person variability is confounded with their between person differences. So their actual level is now a combination of what their true level might be plus some deviation depending on the different situational factors, contextual factors, rated on a cloudy or rainy day. So on Saturday, my satisfaction with my life for the last 10 years, fantastic, very high. But if you ask me today, it hasn't been so great over the last 10 years. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay, but it's tough. So these situational things come into play and they influence the true level. So these are things that obscure our ability to accurately capture someone's true level. And in turn, they obscure our ability to detect change over time and to compare between person differences as well. Um, so again, what happens is all this systematic within person variance is lumped into measurement error or unreliability. Okay, so we're also, by neglecting all this within person variation, we're neglecting our ability to understand the process underlying these why people are varying and changing. So if we're only 
assessing at a single occasion, cross-sectionally, or these widely spaced intervals, we don't, get, we don't have any information as to what are the situational influences that are affecting this within-person variability. And again, this obscures our ability to properly measure differences between people as well. Okay, so one approach to kind of better get at these biases and to kind of better get at true level is to implement this intensive measurement design or measurement burst design. So these are designs where you have many closely spaced assessment points and then you can repeat this at wider, longer intervals in time so that you account for the within-person variability to ideally get you at a higher or more precise true level of the person that's not dependent on their situational or contextual factors, but also by repeating these intensi intensely measured um, sections first over longer intervals, it then allows you to look at change, um, kind of long-term change in these measures that are more reflective of their level at that point in time. So how do these types of designs reduce bias? Well, first off, you're assessing, you're assessing the, um, the construct closer in time to where the experience is actually happening. So the lag time between the experience and the reporting is reduced dramatically. In some cases, you can pretty much eliminate it. So you're basically assessing their experience as it's happening. So the recall bias is reduced considerably. Impression management is also reduced because you have many occasions now rather than just one occasion. So by having many occasions, this, what this allows is it allows the person to report their experience or their behavior without having that be them in a sense. So the example that um, this McAuliffe et al. is with unsafe sexual behaviors. And they had a cross-sectional measure of unsafe sexual behaviors in college students. And then they also took a daily measure, so measured each day over a week. And what they find is the cross-sectional measure, which asks, okay, how frequently do you engage in unsafe sexual behaviors in general? people underreport the frequency that they do this because you don't really want to present yourself in a manner that might be seen, might seem as less desirable. And also you might have this self-perception of yourself as someone who isn't a high risk um, individual. So you report as being on the lower side. But when you actually ask them day by day, how did you engage in a certain behavior? You recall it a lot easier. But also, by engaging that behavior on that day, you're able to discount it as, okay, this isn't me, this isn't who I am, this is one event on one day. So it's, you're more likely to report these types of behaviors. Um, the other example is with parents. And um, they uh, ask parents to rate how much they enjoy spending time with their children. And when you ask cross-sectionally, you ask at a single point in time, people rate this as highest, fantastic. Time with their children is amongst the most enjoyable thing that they could ever do. Uh, but when you ask them day by day, at the end of the day, so on this particular day, to rate the enjoy different events and how enjoyable they are, spending time with their children frequently is ranked amongst the lowest in terms of enjoyment. <laughs> Judging by that reaction, I think you were just outraged that this not can't be true. <laughs> and actually, it's ranked somewhere between commuting and doing laundry. <laughs> um, <laughs> crazy. <laughs> 
so, but when you think about it though, when you ask someone in general, how often do you enjoy spending time or how much do you enjoy spending time with your children? And if you rate that, rate that as being quite low, this says something about you as a parent. You probably feel that says something about you, what you're communicating to the researcher, but that's, you know, that might not influence you that much or it's all confidential. It's probably not that much of a reason why you're going to do this. It's more due to the fact that you perceive yourself as a loving parent and you perceive time with your children as a fantastic bonding experience. So you're relying more on your self-perception, this top-down approach to why to kind of access this recall of this experience rather than a bottom-up approach where you're relying on the actual experience as it's occurring. So when you do that, it's okay on Tuesday to not have really particularly enjoyed time with your kids. But if, you, if this is the case over many days repeated, then this might give you a better indication of the person's actual enjoyment of time with their kids. Because there are going to be days that are going to rate very high and some days low. And you might get a better differentiation between people in this way. Because if you ask just once, most people rate things quite high. And so it's difficult to differentiate their actual experiences and how how much they differ on this construct. Um, same thing comes out with life satisfaction. So if you rate it in general, um, people rate their life satisfaction as being pretty high. It's negatively skewed, it's always you know, up in the seven, eight out of 10 range. But it, you might get a different picture if you ask day by day, how satisfied are you with life today? Well, it's foggy, first of all, it's terrible. Um, and, you know, there's kind of got a pain in my back and I didn't sleep well and it was daylight savings time brought me up an hour of sleep. Why does this happen? So you might rate it pretty low on this one particular day. But if you repeated these assessments many times and this person is continue, consistently rating it as pretty low, then that might be a better indication of how satisfied they actually are with their life than just asking them at one point in time. Um, yeah, so, I prom so going back to my friend's sister, um, yeah. so again, never eats junk food, very healthy family, but what about today, or what about yesterday, did he, well yesterday, I mean it's the last episode of The Bachelor, the big event, we had to have a little bit of ice cream, okay, what about, so day by day, well this day, well I mean it's the third sunny day of the month, so we had to have a special day. So you can discount these things and you can kind of, you get at a, a better assessment of the truth, truth um, in, this, in this manner by asking more frequently than you would potentially by asking with these kind of general widely spaced assessments. Okay, so just going to give you a quick example with life satisfaction. So this is from one burst, a single burst, measured 14 days consecutively. They're asked to rate their daily life satisfaction. So how satisfied are you with your life on this day? And this, they use an adaptation of the satisfaction with life scale. Um, and we also had them initially compu uh, complete the general cross-sectional measure of life satisfaction. So what we find here, so the dotted line is the cross-sectional measure. The solid line, so these are 10 individuals randomly taken from this sample. So the solid line is their average daily score of life satisfaction. The dotted line is their cross-sectional score. And then, the, um, then we have their raw scores for each day. So the first thing that you see is one, there's a lot of variability that people have in their life satisfaction. <clears throat> people who measure life satisfaction, well-being researchers for decades, they always consider this to be a very stable characteristic. It's a very stable construct. People don't fluctuate in their life satisfaction. Why do we have to measure it more frequently? But this is an assumption that we often don't 
test. We don't measure things more often, so we don't know if they actually fluctuate or not. And when you do, you see that in this case, people fluctuate quite a bit in their day-to-day -day life satisfaction. So how satisfied are you with your life today? The other thing that you notice is that the cross-sectional measures, in this case, they're all higher than the average daily measure. And in fact, over 85% of the sample reported their cross-sectional life satisfaction, so if you ask in general, as being higher than their average day-to-day -day life satisfaction. So this goes back to the top-down versus bottom-up approach. Top-down approach, you might perceive yourself as being a particularly happy person. You might report as being a little bit higher. The bottom-up approach, if you have an actual experience of this day, which you can kind of lean on as clear evidence of how you felt about this day, and you might get a different, um, it probably differs quite a bit from your cross-sectional general level, but then repeat it over many days. And if you have sufficient number of days for this window of time, then you have this cumulative life satisfaction. And this might be, I mean, it's the top-down approach, the perception, that might be of interest substantively, um, if that's what you're interested in, if you're interested in perceptions of a certain behavior or a certain construct. But it differs from this bottom-up approach of actual lived experience recall of it. Okay, so the other thing, because we see so much variation in this measure, it's important to be able to disaggregate the within-person variation from these between-person differences. And if we're only measuring at one point in time, we have difficulty, we're not able to do that. We're not able to, to disaggregate the variability over this window of time from the person's true level. So these intensive measurement designs, when we measure something frequently, it allows us to disaggregate the within-person variation from the between-person differences. And this reduces the confound in the between-person effects. And it also allows us to examine, okay, why is it that these people are fluctuating in this measure? What's occurring on these days that's leading them to be higher on this measure relative to their average levels? Um, yeah. Okay, so with between person differences, you can consider it, you can think of it as how do people differ relative to others? So if we're using a single measure or a mean, an average over several days, we get deviations from the grand mean. So how much does your personal mean deviate from the grand mean? And this gives us the between person differences. Within person variation, this is how much, so if this was someone's raw score across 14 days, the within-person variation is now how much does your level on this particular occasion deviate from your personal mean, your typical level. So by separating these out, we get, we get at two different questions essentially. We get at how do people differ from each other and how do people differ from themselves? If we're only measuring at one point in time, first of all, we can't separate out the within-person variation, but we also could be hindered by the fact that we might be measuring um, a particular point in time when someone is unusually high on their measure and someone else is unusually low. And now the rank ordering in the between person differences is shuffled around. And now it's impossible to determine if this is because the person is actually higher on this measure or if it's because they're having a particularly good or bad day. Okay, so by measuring more frequently, this really allows us to focus on the within person relationships. 
So again, we use the person's own mean as a comparison. So it's less impacted by how they interpret the question or how they um, maybe perceive the language of the question because we're not, because it's relative to themselves now. So why are they differing from their own typical level? So we use the, their own personal mean as their control. And this allows us to get at some interesting questions. So why is, for example, why is their well-being higher or lower on this occasion? Um, and it again puts us more of the emphasis on process. So what are other situational or contextual factors that are going into this person's day or this occasion that's leading to them to have higher or lower scores than is typical for them? But if your focus is on between person differences and you're interested in why are some individuals differing relative to others, using these designs also gives you a better estimate of that. So you're separating out all this within person variation from that and you're potentially getting a more accurate estimate of their true level. So it's not, not as dependent on the situational influences and again it reduces all those biases that we discussed earlier. And finally, with, um, yeah, so it also improves reliability. So having several measures repeated over time will improve your between person reliability. And it also allows you to estimate the reliability at the within person level. Okay, so again, this is that example where um, people were complete cross sectional measure of life satisfaction, positive affect, and negative affect. And they also completed a 14-day daily measure. And we look at the reliability of the between-person design, so cross-sectional measure reliability, and comparing that to the person average from the daily measure, you see the reliability is quite a bit higher when you use these intensive measurement designs. And that will just happen because you have more assessments, you have more frequent assessments. Okay. I find it's always good to pause just to make sure you can hear the clock ticking. <laughs> Still ticking. Um, so there's also these intensive measurement designs still have some issues with them as well. Several. Um, I'm just going to talk about a few. The first issue, the main issue that I find is that there's little to no work being done on improving the measures that are tailored for these types of designs. So there's very few studies that assess the psychometric properties of these types of intensive, these these measures that are designed for intensive repeated measurement purposes. Um, so because of this, it's difficult to, to know if these, this within person variability that is being captured with these designs is true variability or if it's just due to measurement error because we're using really poor measures to capture it. So often the measures, they are treated as manifest variables. So again, it assumes that, it makes the assumption that all the within person variation is true variation. And this completely neglects the fact that there could be measurement error kind of riddled throughout it. So again, going back to this figure, when we have this burst design, we're assuming that all this within person variability is being captured accurately with our measures. But you see that each measurement observation is a combination of the true score plus any error. So it could be the case that we could have a measure that's way up here. And we're just going to be assuming that all this is true within person variability and neglecting the fact that it's just a very poor measure with lots of measurement error. So a lot of these types of designs, people who use measures don't don't really assess reliability of the measures. They don't really 
look at the factor structure if they're using they're using composite scores. They don't really give any sort of rigorous assessment of how good these measures are. Um, yeah, so with With any measurement, there's a number of different sources of variation. I'm not going to go through this in much detail, but just so you're aware that there's different unique variances that represent differences between people, unshared with other variables. There's common variance reflecting differences between persons shared with other variables. So these are what you commonly see in a standard factor analysis. So the common variance among variables. Um, at the within person level, there's also unique variance in each variable that's unshared with other variables. And then common variance reflecting changes within person shared with other variables. So on any given occasion, if you have a number of items measuring a certain construct, and you give this on any given occasion, do the items vary within person, so relative to their own typical level, in the same direction? So is there common covariance amongst these, um, amongst these variables measured within person? And then finally, we have the unsystematic residual variance. So when we, use, when we measure frequently and we don't we use these manifest variables to assess that, we're assuming that all of the unsystematic variance is just true variance. So this brings us into this multivariate measurement burst. Um, and what this does is it allows us to specify latent factors at both the within level and the between level. So you have a number of items measured at each occasion. So each occasion can be represented now by a, um, by a within person latent variable, as well as a between person latent variable. Now, talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, so what this does is it just attenuates the within-person variance and covariance. It also permits within-person variation and change within burst to be based on true score variance. So the latent scores or the latent values. Um, again, yeah, this attenuating measurement error both within and between person levels. And now we can specify a measurement model for both the within person and between person factor structure. So I'm not going to go through this. I'll show a picture instead. Um, so this is the equation of the multi-level measurement model where you have a series of observations for any individual i at time point j. Um, and each one is represented by a vector of intercepts and then you have a factor loading at the within person level on the within person latent variable plus some residual error um, plus factor loading on the between person um, latent variable plus error. Looks better like this, I think. So again, you can specify the within person structure and the between person structure where each individual item, you're, um, you're identifying the common covariance. So the within person factor structure is the common covariance in each individual item across items. So on days when you report higher levels of Y1, you also report higher levels of Y2, Y3, Y4, Y5 relative to your typical level. So it's all relative to each individual's typical level. And then the between person level, the indicators are now represented by the person's mean. So it's their average score across the time points. And how do those co-vary with other indicators relative to other individuals? So again, the within person is covariance of indicators at each occasion, and this is pooled across people and occasions. And then the between person is indicators 
or the person means and it's the covariance among the indicator means. Okay. So this describes the within person structure describes how indicators vary together when measured at the same occasion. And then in between is how do vari variables go together across people. So another example, well, it'll be the same example, I guess, with the life satisfaction measure. Again, a single burst. You can see, so this life satisfaction measure was a five item scale, measured 14 days. And you can see that on days when people reported higher than average on one item, they also report higher than average on all the other items. So it's kind of a consistent um, single factor solution. And this fits very well at both the within and the between. So at the between level, now it's individuals who report higher on one item on average also report higher on the other items on average. But you get a weight, so a weight for each of the items, which allows you to disattenuate any measurement error that might be included in that. So now your latent score, rather than just being all within person variability, now it's the true score variability. And again, with this, we can get at the reliability of both the between person level and the within person level. So this omega reliability coefficient is just the true score variance divided by total variance. So it allows us to get an assessment of the quality of the within person measure. How well does this actually fit to the construct that we think it's measuring? Another important feature is that it separates out the within person structure from the between person structure. So now our between person factor structure doesn't have the within person variability with um, kind of confounded within it. It's separated out. So it's more of a true measure of the between person factor structure. Important point that I want to make is that the factor structure can differ at the within and between person level. So this is, yeah, I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on this just in general, this idea of within person associations and between person associations. I find that it's pretty challenging to kind of wrap your head around. Why can a within person association be different from a between person association? And the same thing with the factor structure. Why is it that a factor structure within a person is differing from factor structure between people. So the example, I'm going to start with just kind of a generic example, which I think illustrates it really nicely. And then I'll talk a little bit more about my own research examples. So the first example is typing speed and accuracy. So if you think of at the between person level, so between person associations are how do you um, what is the association relative to other people? Whereas the within person association is what is this relationship relative to yourself? So relative to yourself changing. So if you think of typing speed and accuracy, people who, if you look at this cross sectionally, individuals who type faster are also to type faster relative to other individuals are also generally more accurate relative to other individuals. They're just more skilled. They're better skilled typers. So they type faster and they type more accurately. So you have this direct relationship. But if you think within person, okay, relative to yourself, on occasions when you type faster than is normal, or than is average for you, you're probably going to make more errors than is average for you or than is typical for you. So you see this inverse relationship. So I borrowed this example from Steve Boker. I should probably mention that because um, I find it to be just a really clear, easy example to understand. So on occasions or trial to trial, when you're typing faster than is typical for you, you're going to make more errors and you're going to have 
poor accuracy. So you have this completely different association. So relative to yourself, the association is not always going to be the same as relative to others. Um, okay, so the example that I have is looking at positive and negative affect. So this is a measure of the PANIS, I'm sure most of you are somewhat familiar with it, it measures an individual's positive and negative affect on 10 items each. Um, so we had two independent samples that rated their positive and negative affect, one over seven days, the other over 14 days. There's been a lot of debate in the literature as to what is the association between positive and negative affect. Um, when this measure was originally developed, it was believed that cross or between person association should be zero, that they're independent. So your level of positive affect is independent of your level of negative affect. But when they started measuring this cross-sectionally, most research found that there's these two constructs that were inversely related. So those who are higher on negative affect are generally lower on positive affect. There's this inverse relationship. The problem is, is that you had all this within-person variability confounded with it. So you had differences at the within-person level, a different relationship than you did at the between-person level. This could be affecting your between-person association. So we tested three models. One is that there's a single bipolar factor. So the experience of negative affect precludes the experience of positive affect. So they're on opposite ends of the same spectrum. So you're either, if you're high on one, being high on one is the same as being low on the other. The other, one, the other model we tested is two correlated factors. So they're distinct, but they're inversely related. And then finally, these two independent factors, where they're distinct factors, they're distinct constructs, and there's no relation between them. So how you interpret um, what this means, whether or not it's bipolar, correlated, or independent, really depends on whether you're looking at the within-person association or the between-person association. If you're considering a single bipolar factor at the within-person level, this is saying that on the same occasion, individuals do not experience both positive and negative affect. So if you're experiencing high levels of positive affect, you by necessity have to be having low levels of negative affect. They're opposite ends of the spectrum. At the between person level, this is individuals who experience more positive affect than others don't also experience more negative affect than others. Okay. The two independent factors at the within person level is you can experience both high positive and negative affect at the same occasion. They're not related to one another. Whereas at the between person level, it's those who experience more positive affect on average than others can also experience more negative affect on average. So averaged over time, you can be higher, high on both positive and negative affect relative to the typical level of others. So what we found was that at the within person, at both the within and between person level, there's two distinct factors. So positive and negative affect didn't belong on one single dimension. So they're distinct of each other. But the within person level, we found that they were inversely related. So on occasions when you experience more positive affect, you're less likely to, you experience less negative affect. But there's no relationship at the between person level. So they're independent of the between, at the between person level. So one of the reasons with these cross-sectional measures why they could have consistently been finding this inverse relationship when looking at between person differences is that it was always measured at the same occasion. Their positive and negative affect was measured at the same occasion, even though it was in general. Their situational mood is likely playing a role there, and that's driving up that correlation. That might not be the case if you're separating it out. Um, so I'm just going to show you 
kind of a diagram or a figure to try to make this point a little bit more clear. So if you consider that each dot represents one day for one individual, and you have negative affect on the x-axis, positive affect on the y-axis, you can see that over the course of seven days, someone might have a relationship that looks something like this. So on days when they're experiencing more negative affect, their positive affect is lower. And on days when they're experiencing more positive affect, their negative affect is lower. So they have this inverse relationship. But each person also has kind of their average level that is typical to them. And if you looked across people, every person could potentially have this same negative inverse relationship, but on average be at a different point in the positive and negative affect scale. That's how many people we measure. I don't know. Um, and so overall, you could have no relationship at all. So even though within person, on, each, on any given occasion, relative to yourself, you have this negative association. Between people, you could have someone who's high on average on both positive and negative affect, someone who's high on positive affect, low on negative affect, someone who's high on negative, low on positive, or low on both. So it gives no indication your average level relative to others. Okay, there's no association there. Okay, um, yeah, I'm going to just breeze through one last example. And this is, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's basically just to show that not only do the within and between person associations, not only do they not have to be the same at the within and between person level, the pattern of associations can also differ at the within and between person level. So this is, um, an example of, uh, it's a working title. <laughs> so this is looking at the effect of stress on negative affect and the impact that this measure called cognitive interference plays in kind of um, in moderating or mediating this relationship between stress and negative affect. So these results are, uh, fresh out of the oven, but have been kind of sitting on the windowsill for a long time. <laughs> no one's eaten them yet, but they've been sitting around for a while. Um, so looking at this relationship between stress and negative affect, you consistently find that on days when you have higher stress, you also have higher levels of negative affect. Cognitive interference, what this is, is this is a measure of kind of distracted thoughts, these off-task thinking. So and this, um, yeah, thoughts, continu continuously having thoughts that sort of pull you away from your current activity, your current task. So in the past, a lot of the, a lot of the associations have been looked at at a between person level, and it's assumed to have this mediational effect that stress impacts negative affect because it leads to higher cognitive interference. Um, yeah, let me see this. But we propose that it differs at the within person level. It's more of a moderator at the within person level. So on days when you have higher levels of stress, it predicts negative affect, but this relationship is more dependent on your level of cognitive interference. So it's not because you were always going to have higher cognitive interference that's going to lead to this. It's going to change depending on your level of cognitive interference and it's more interactive. But we'd also, we also tested the mediation at the between person level. And this is pretty much what we find. We find that we have this interaction at the within person level. There is no interaction at the between person level, but we have this mediation model where the effect of stress on the negative affect is reduced to non-significance when you include cognitive interference as the mediating path. So this is just an example to show that the pattern of results at the within and the between person level 
don't always have to match either. And this really depends on what you're measuring and how you're measuring. And you really have to think about what is the association relative to the individual, relative to themselves, and what is the association relative to other people? Um, yeah, so I'll show you the figures because they're, they're nice figures, and I know Philippe will appreciate it. Um, so this is with in-person interaction, where if you divide it up, so on days when your stress is higher than average, so zero being the mean, you see that your negative affect is higher. But this depends on your level of cognitive interference. So when you have higher than average cognitive interference, the effect is exacerbated. And when you have lower than average cognitive interference, so if you're not having these distracting thoughts, then the stress actually doesn't impact your negative affect. Um, show that differently. You can use this technique that shows the, the effect of stress on negative affect across varying levels of cognitive interference. So this solid line here, this is basically the association between stress and negative affect. And you can see that it differs depending on what your daily score of, or your daily report of cognitive interference is. So when you have below average cognitive interference, so the, the gray bands, these are the confidence intervals. So this is when stress no longer has an effect on negative affect, when it crosses the zero point. So you can see that when you have your cognitive interference is more than one standard deviation below your typical level, the impact of stress on negative affect is reduced to non-significance. So your stressful your stressful days and the severity of your stressful day is really there be when you allow yourself to have these distracting thoughts and that's what kind of leads to that increased um, negative mood. So if you don't have these distracting thoughts, if you're not consumed by these, other, um, these thoughts that are pulling you away from your present moment or pulling you away from what you're doing at hand, then you see that the stress doesn't impact your negative affect. Okay. Huh, there's a lot. Um, okay, just to kind of wrap up, in terms of optimizing assessments, I'm kind of, I'm pretty convinced that these intensive measurement designs, these burst designs are relevant for almost anyone, even if you're not particularly interested in looking at within person associations. I feel that it's, it's very useful to implement these designs to get a better true level at that window of time. And that will allow you to get at a better true change score over time as well. Because you're, you're able to disattenuate these different sources of variation, you're able to get at a better, better measure of the construct, reduce different biases. But there's also challenges in um, implementing these. They're pretty intensive, it's shocking. Um, but there's a lot of burden on the participants sometimes. You wanna measure something for a month straight every day, this is gonna place a lot of burden on the participant. So we have to continuously be aware of how frequently we need to measure, but also how much is too much. So at what point are we kind of detracting from the quality of the measure because we're burning out the participant, we're putting too much burden on them, they're getting tired of responding. So we need to come up with different ways to effectively implement these types of designs. Um, it's getting easier and easier to do it with these different mobile, mobile assessments, different, um, we get into different types of tracking devices, things like that, that take away the burden of the participant having to actually go out of their way to report things. And we can just observe them objectively without them being aware, but also with these self-reports, we can do it not including so many measures in a way that kind of gets at 
more efficiently level without having to have this long battery of um, assessments, assessment scales. So there's always a trade-off you have to consider. You don't want someone to spend an hour every day filling out a hundred items questionnaire, but we still need sufficient items to ensure that the measures that we are using are valid and reliable. So there's this balance that we have to, that has to come into it. And for me personally, I would think that spending 10 minutes a day for 20 days is more valuable than having someone spend three hours one day to get a single assessment point, which is often done. So we have to kind of consider that. Um, the other thing that's always really important to consider is the time interval that we need to measure. How frequently do we need to implement these assessments every day, many times within the day, once a week, once a month. This really depends on what we're measuring and how, how much we expect it to vary and how frequently we expect it to vary. And so there's not really an easy answer for how frequently we have to measure. So it's a challenge that we all have to keep in mind. And I think I'll just end there because I talked a long time. <laughs> Thank you. Could you go back to that uh, uh, graph with various designs, like three different designs? Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, I don't, I don't know, you know, do you know how much more powerful would it be those either to have the time of the measurement be part of the model like when you like randomize the time of measurement? I know it might not be very economical to do that, to collect data in that way, but if you like do a, each person get a randomized time when they measured, right? That's going to increase the, the power of that. So I'm trying to understand, do you have a feel how much more powerful that would be if, if that's going to be worth the investment of, of money? Um, yeah, so in terms of random, like randomizing when you sample, in a sense, um, there, are, there are some designs that do that, but they do, they randomize within the day when they sample. So you have this sort of randomized schedule within a day so that you get this ideally representative um, sample of experiences that the people have. But in terms of randomizing over years, um, I haven't seen anything like that. And it, I think there's so few studies that implement these first designs that have the intensive measurement period repeated over several years that just doing that at all is kind of has been pushing the, the limits of what anyone does. So then to randomize when the bursts happen, um, I haven't seen that at all. But I think that, yeah, I think that's important because you have these cyclical types of um, influences and you have a number of different influences. So I think that's good way to sample representative sample of experiences across time and life. But in terms of the, the, the model and the power that it gains from that, I haven't looked at anything like that, so I'm not really sure. Um, this might seem like a pretty obvious question, but um, so would you recommend measuring say stable traits or like kind of personality in burst design as well as maybe like across annual assessments and things like that or would you plan your design differently and your measures differently? Yeah well these so-called stable traits sometimes aren't as stable as it's always assumed that they are and I think there has to be some examination of how stable are these traits actually? And then that can sort of drive 
your design decisions in terms of do I need to sample this every day or once a month or whatever, or maybe just one point in time is sufficient. Um, but until you kind of examine, uh, is this trait stable? This is, I mean, if it's a trait, it should be stable, I guess. But is this characteristic stable? Then you don't, it's really tough to say, well, I think it is, so let's just go with that assumption. So I think it's important to examine it first and then move from there. But I think that using these kind of intensive designs, they're becoming pretty easy to do. They're pretty accessible to implement. And so the cost of them really isn't as high as it used to be in terms of time and effort. So I don't see that it's um, a worthwhile kind of approach to try to implement these and try to examine are these things as stable as we believe to be. But with that comes the investment in the measures because what you're measuring is now different and how you're asking questions is now different. So you have to be consider of that and it's a challenge to get into that and do you always want to create new measures for every different time scale? Maybe you have to, but it, again, it depends on what you're measuring. Just as a follow-up to that, there was a big event yesterday. People are talking about it as a game changer when Apple unveiled a new watch, but they also unveiled a new health research kit that makes use of the broad Apple iPhone platform for collection of health-related data and potential uh, data that could be actionable, that would, would feed back. So it's a game changer because you've got a big investment in this and it's really raising the profile of this, but you and many others have looked at it, the role of technology and how to bring this all together. I guess what's, what's your view of, of, of next steps there? I think uh, as we've talked a bit over this uh, series about health research and patient reported outcomes, there's often been a, you know, not so much an emphasis in the, in, in the field on repeated measurements, short-term measurements along the lines of what you've said, but what, what are the next steps and where do we go? How, how do we make use of these now emerging broad platforms for this kind of research? Yeah, so with these new devices, um, it's certainly becoming very accessible to obtain a lot of information about the person, a lot of potentially useful information um, with the eye, or the iWatch. I guess the battery life is only eight hours or something like this, 12 hours, so maybe they need some tweaks. Um, but there's certainly a lot more potential to examine these frequent variations within people and get a better idea of how these variations play out in the long term. Um, you still need some other, well, I still believe that we're interested in psychology and different fields in what the person actually experiences. So having some report from themselves on what they experience in terms of pain, in terms of satisfaction, in terms of different things, and pairing that with these more objective measures, I think is a really fruitful kind of avenue to head toward. But I think these within-person associations, we don't really know what they mean in the long term. We can say, okay, that on this given, over this window of time during this month, when I'm consistently more active, I have much higher positive affect, I have higher life satisfaction, I have more um, excitement and interest in my activities. But what does that translate into long-term changes? What is, how, does that, how does that association at the within-person level play out in terms of how you kind of age over time? Uh, I think that everything is about momentary experiences. Our whole life is comprised of momentary experiences. So if we're finding benefits in our momentary experiences that are repeatable and we can repeat these things, then that's important and valuable to know because that's, that is our aging process. That is everything is these continuous stream of momentary experiences. Um, but yeah, I think that it just, because the work with these more longer term bursts isn't there yet, we don't really know what that 
short-term association means for long-term change. Jonathan, thank you so much. That was an outstanding talk that brought together a lot of the methodological issues, the importance of within-person measurement, uh, ways to go about developing better measures. I very much appreciate your points that it's going to take some work to identify what are the appropriate intervals and how we can best refine measurements for within-person. So outstanding. Thank you so much. Yeah.